But I don't want to turn to uh, science for its own sake. Francis Bacon, who inspired the founders of the Royal Society, said that there were two reasons for doing science. One was enlightenment, the other was, I quote, the relief of man's estate. I've spoken mainly about the second. Let me say a bit about science and enlightenment. There is a less utilitarian reason why the public needs a field for science, which is because of its enlightening uh, quality, because it's part of our culture. Indeed, science is the only global culture. Protons, proteins and Pythagoras are the same from China to Peru. Scientists in my own field have, in recent decades, delineated the chain of events that led from some mysterious beginning 13 billion years ago to the emergence of atoms, stars, galaxies and planets. And biologists have learned how, on at least one planet, the biosphere emerged and Darwinian selection led to creatures with brains able to ponder their origin and the wonder and the mystery. It's a cultural deprivation to be unaware of this wonderful and fast developing story. This year we're celebrating Darwin's 200th anniversary. It's also the 400th anniversary of Galileo's telescope. And I'd like to mention in my closing minutes a scientific hope which I have for 2050 which links Darwin and Galileo. It's to discover whether life exists beyond our Earth. Nowhere else in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. There's no reason other than exploration to send people elsewhere in our solar system. But suppose we widen our gaze beyond our solar system to other stars. Since the 1990s, we've learned that many stars, probably most, are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is. The evidence up to now pertains to giant planets, objects the size of Saturn or Jupiter. They're the only ones that have been possible to detect. But the astronomical highlight of this year will be the launch, hopefully next week, of NASA's Kepler spacecraft, which should reveal planets no bigger than the Earth, orbiting other stars by detecting the slight dimming of a star when a planet transits in front of it. It'll be a decade or two before we can actually image Earth-like planets, rather than just recording their shadows. It's a task like seeing a far-fly next to a searchlight, requiring giant arrays in space or a new generation of telescopes on the ground. But that'll come in the next two decades. But would there be life on any of these Earth-like planets? We know too little about how life started here to venture firm odds. But the outcome of the quest for alien life will influence our concept of our place in nature as profoundly as Darwinism has over the 150 years since the publication of Origin of Species. You may have learnt by 2050 whether biological evolution is unique to the pale blue dot in the cosmos that is our home, or whether Darwin's writ runs in the wider universe. It's sometimes wrongly imagined that astronomers must be serenely unconcerned about next year, next week and tomorrow. I'd like to include with a cosmic perspective which actually strengthens my own concern about the here and now. Ever since Darwin, we've been familiar with the stupendous time spans of the evolutionary past. Indeed, all of us have, except creationists in some places like the uh, and lastly, Governor's Mansion and other benighted areas. Um, but most people, though aware of our evolutionary past, still somehow think that we humans are the culmination of the evolutionary tree. But no astronomer, I think, could believe this. That's because our sun, formed five and a half billion years ago, it's been there a long time, but it's got six billion more before the fuel runs out. And the expanding universe will continue perhaps forever. And as Woody Allen said, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> it won't be humans who witness the sun's demise. It'll be creatures 
as different from us as we are from a bug. There's as much time for evolution between now and the death of the sun as there has been that's led to our emergence. But even in this concertina timeline, extending billions of centuries and millions of centuries in the future, as well as millions of centuries in the past, this one century is special. It's the first in our planet's history where one species, ours, could jeopardize not only itself, but life's immense future potential. Suppose the worst of aliens out there, and that they've been watching our planet for its entire history. What would they have seen? Over nearly all that immense time, four and a half billion years, Earth's appearance would have changed very gradually. The continents drifted, the ice cover waxed and waned, successive species emerged, evolved and became extinct. But in just a tiny sliver of the Earth's history, the last one millionth part, just a few thousand years, the patterns of vegetation altered much faster than before. This signaled the start of agriculture, and the pace of change accelerated as human populations rose and had more impact on the environment. Then there were other changes, even more abrupt. Within 50 years, little more than one hundredth of a millionth of the Earth's age, the CO2 in the atmosphere began to rise anomalously fast. And something else unprecedented happened. Small projectiles launched from the planet's surface escaped the biosphere completely. Some were propelled into orbits around the Earth, some journeyed to the Moon and planets. If they understood astrophysics, the aliens could confidently predict that the biosphere would face doom in a few billion years when the sun flares up and dies. But could they have predicted this unprecedented fever halfway through the Earth's life? These human-induced alterations occupying overall less than a minute of the elapsed time of the Earth and seemingly occurring with runaway speed. If they continued to keep watch, what might these hypothetical aliens witness in the next hundred years? Will a final spasm be followed by silence? Or will the planet itself stabilize? And will some of the objects launched from the Earth spawn new oases of life elsewhere? Well, the outcome depends on our generation. Wise choices will require the idealistic and effective efforts of natural scientists, environmentalists, social scientists and humanists, all guided by the knowledge the 21st century science can offer and the James Martin School can interpret and propagate. Thank you very much.